Let us pray. Sound check. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Let us pray. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks in the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them. But the righteous live by their faith. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As I said, this is the third and last Sunday that I'll be with you. It's been great. And the subjects that, that my sermons, the first two sermons, and then also this one, uh, have been concentrated on some of the spiritual practices God has given us to help us make the most of the time of waiting that we are living in, on the road, but not yet arrived. Begun that Jesus is birthed and shaped and illuminated by the sure expectation that Jesus is coming again in great glory. To make the most of this time of waiting and to be ready when it comes, second coming comes, uh, is to be at work alongside God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Realize with them in part the beauty the holiness, the healing, the rightings of wrong, the loving care for those among us who are victims of injustice in all its forms, which is the kingdom of God that came near us when Jesus walked the earth, and the Holy Spirit has kept close to us ever since. Here is the basis of a Christian life, to do our Father in Heaven's will in here and now. We, have, we seek to heal ourselves in order to go out and heal others. And as in the case of being ready and being at work alongside our, alongside our triune God, it is intended that these two activities go on simultaneously. The practice of gratitude to God, the healing from a pain that places in us a desire for revenge, the deepening of our, of our approach toward the natural world, the introduction of expectant, persistent prayer to counter our pessimism, our despair about our own present and future prospects, and to affirm God's love, presence, and power in our lives. Here are the spiritual practices we have talked about in the past weeks, and their opposites. In gratitude when God blesses us, settled hatred towards those who have hurt us deeply, a limited apprehension of our relation to the land or the natural world, an insufficiently expectant understanding of prayer. These are like the demons in Jesus' story in Matthew. Now, I'm not sure all of us remember that story. But he is telling us about a certain person and the spiritual house, spiritual being of that person is infested with an unclean spirit. You know, from our other stories of Jesus, an unclean spirit was, was common in that period of time and he often exorcised them successfully. But in this case, there is an exorcism demon is expelled, but unlike in the other stories of Jesus, there is not a happy ending. Why not? Because the householder, the person, did not do the one needful thing. Listen to this passage. Quote, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, after a period of, quote, wandering through waterless regions, which is the usual environment for demons, demons sorry, it decides, the demon decides, it would be better to return and see if it can get in again. 
I will return to my house from which I came, he says. When the demon arrives, the house is, quote, empty, swept, and put in order, close quote. But does this respectable condition of the house keep him out? Remember, the house is that person. The opposite. The demon goes and wants, <laughs> rounds up seven other demons to come with him, and they all take up residence. And the story's conclusion is sad. Jesus says, the last state of the person is worse than the first. What does all this mean? I, for one, for many years, uh, was not at all clear what this I was meant to gain or learn from this story. And then I heard a sermon a few years ago that brought it all into focus, to clarify it, that made it all make sense. And I'm not sure. The key word in the description of the house or the person after the first demon has been gone for a while and returns is empty. Empty. This person's spiritual house was swept in an order, but it was also empty. The person was on his own, spiritually seeking. And demons, as well as nature, abhor a vacuum. Only if we invite Jesus to live with us, only if we have Jesus in residence, even if our house is swept and put in order, will the demons go away permanently? The spiritual practices we have talked about in our earlier weeks are all means of inviting Jesus into the center of our lives and keeping him there and expelling the demons permanently. So today, I want to offer yet another spiritual practice that will aid us in inviting Jesus in and having him live with us. And this one I'm calling Offering Up Our Limitations to God. So the first step in acquiring this spiritual practice is to identify, to explain, what is the character of limitations? What does that mean? And also, what are our limitations? Yours and mine. Well, limitations are composed of what we have wanted or want for ourselves, deeply wanted, skills, opportunities, strength and health of the body, a child, children, fame, money, and also that we know or fear that we will not get. Our health is not perfect. Our skills are not infinite and superior to all the others in the same fields or careers. Our opportunities are fewer than we wanted or wanted at present. You're not getting any younger. You realize that? And it hurts. It's hurt when we identify these limitations. We feel frustration, we feel disappointment, we perhaps even fear of the future, perhaps anger at persons who are, we are sure got in the way, or institutions that have impeded us, or God, or simply ourselves. The next step in the spiritual practice is we offer our limitations up to God. What does offer up mean? Here are two definitions uh, from dictionaries. The first is from the Webster Collegiate, and it says to offer means to present an act of worship or devotion, to present something in an act of worship or devotion. Another word that's very close to the meaning is sacrifice. From the OED, the Oxford Concise Dictionary, we have this definition to offer up something, to present prayer or sacrifice to a deity. So, what I'm talking about here is to offer up our limitations to God. And there are three points we are making when we do that. We 
we are acknowledging we have not gotten what we want. A. B. That we trust God to make something good out of what we can only see as a failure of the best. And C. That he wants to and can show his strength in our weakness and bless us in our present and also in our future. When we offer up our limitations to God. We are trusting Paul's teaching. As he heard it in God's word, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in your weakness. So here are some examples from my life. Because I have been practicing the spirit of practice uh, quite a lot. So I'm offering up, for instance, my frustration and despair about ever paying off my student loan. I'm offering up my disappointment at not getting the Nobel Prize. <laughs> What's happening, fellas? I'm offering up my fear that I will not get everything done that I want to get done before I die. I'm offering up my fear about the health of my older sister. I'm offering up my pessimism that I can help my older daughter spiritually, who is not a believer. I offer these up. I place them on your altar, God. I'm putting them at the foot of your cross. And when we offer up our limitations, it's also an admission of weakness, <coughs> of defeat, of disappointment. And as I have said, it's also an expression of trust. And therefore, expectation that God will not disappoint us. He will not leave us hanging in the air. He will act. He will rush in to help us. He will perfect his power in our weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And I can testify, along with many, many others through thousands of centuries, 2,000 centuries. I think of Mother Teresa, who offered up her limitations to God and received lessons. I think of Martin Luther, who offered up his fears, his limitations, limitating his limitation of his fears, and received blessing. Because when we do this, God evidences his power in yours and my particular lives. He changes us. He changes our attitude. He changes our circumstances. We find unexpected things happening. We find that fear things don't happen. He shifts our attention and our efforts to secure safety and admiration in and by anyone or anything other than in God. The God who loves us absolutely, unconditionally, to whom we are as precious as his only son, Jesus, whose life he sacrificed, that we may live eternally in his grace and love. Starting now. Now for me, it is a work in progress, but my efforts to offer up my limitations to God is moving me in the direction of letting go my conviction that I can't go on without getting this or that, or being this or that, or having this skill or opportunity or that I'm older than I was last year. So here's the best I can do here and now to explain what I have been benefiting from myself. I urge you to duplicate this effort in your lives. Offer up your limitations to God and see what happens. Because because when you do get into this habit of offering up your limitations to God, you will find yourself living in a new way, heroically in human terms, and faith-filled in believers' terms. And like Paul, you can read about in Acts, day in and day out. Like Paul, despite those setbacks that he had, those hardships, those losses, you will be content. Because, like Paul, you have been caught up with God in paradise. 
and you are honored to heal and save and perfect the good news that Jesus was and is Lord. We need to absorb it, this great truth, this gospel truth. Not only know it intellectually, but make it part of us. Physically part of us, emotionally part of us, spiritually part of us. The makeup of our essential selves. And when we do this, organically, like phosphorus, we radiate this good news to others. Thank you, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just a note, uh, in my last sermon, I talked about prayers, persistent prayers for particular things. I talked about taking note of them uh, and seeing what happens, how God answers your prayers. And I'll discuss that a little bit more in announcements.